God, only your spirit gives us that ability or desire. We ask for that now. Help us to grow up beyond milk into the meat of what you would show us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please sit down. As you sit down and relax there a minute, um, I hope you enjoyed that opening tune written by Charles Wesley, um, the great rip off the latest good drinking pub song and reorient it towards God with new words. Um, you could just feel it. I just wanted to sling my tankard left and right as we sang that old song, which kind of tells you where Charles spent a lot of evenings. <laughs> as we look at this and we dig in, into this series. We're going to look at Jesus as rabbi and so much more. The first thing we have to understand is the Jews' love and understanding of Scripture, Torah, a word that's actually not some magic spiritual word. Yes, it refers to the first five books, but it's a word that simply means instruction, not law. It's often interpreted the law of the Lord. It's actually not the greatest translation to say that. It's actually the instruction of the Lord that he's talking about. One of my favorite places in the world is New York City, 21, almost 22 million people now. And my favorite borough, which is the size of a county, is Brooklyn, across the East River, looking into Manhattan when you look due west. Over in Brooklyn, two and a half million people, there's this complex, multi-ethnic, paradoxical, colorful place. That means really good food. There are four people groups that live in this beautiful borough of New York City. Starting in the bottom left, the original birthplace of the hipster that made suede lace-up shoes cool again. They're the ones who made skinny tight jeans cool again, and they will make bell bottoms cool again. To the right of them is this very vibrant and sometimes complex urban black community that has lived there a very long time. Above them, the Puerto Ricans with a smattering of Dominicans who usually get along, but not always. And then on the left, in contrast to this cacophony of people groups, are the very conservative Hasidics and some Jews that are even more conservative than them. These people are an amazing people to watch. And the Jews were the most amazing because you've got three groups of people who live in the 21st century, the devolution of Western society, and the Jews who just don't pay attention to it and keep doing their thing. Their hats, their coats, their shoes, their pantaloons with stockings, their haircuts and behaviors straight out of 8th century Eastern Europe imported into the 21st century in a time warp. Their life continues to be centered around synagogue. That is a synagogue in Brooklyn. Can you imagine? That's just the men. The women, I don't agree, I don't want to hear it, right, are seated above them in mass with all of their kids. And this rhythm of life centered around that synagogue, their rabbis being their shepherds and their teachers. You can recognize them anywhere. They wear yarmulkes, the little hat. They wear the prayer shawls, the zitzit. They wear the phylacteries, the little strap with the leather boxes on their forehead. And they wrap their arms in tefillin, that long strap. And if you notice that bottom right, when you get to the hand, you form what looks like a W, but it's the Hebrew letter shin or sin, depending on how it's used and where the little vowel mark is. It refers to Shaddai, one of the names for God. In those little boxes is written this passage. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You'll teach them diligently to your children. And you'll talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you'll bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And when they put these on, they quote this. It's beautiful. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. I find it so interesting that he uses that word betrothed there in Hosea. 
This kind of love that stands out in an outward sign, we would say is quite freakish and would be absolutely terrifying for a Kiwi to stand out like that in a public setting. Unless, of course, you were my 21-year-old who isn't, has never had a moment of second-guessing that. But they do it not as a sign of hubris, but with millions of Jews globally, they would tell you they're wrapped up with God in their meaning, in their purpose, their identity, their belonging, their values, their shared life and journey in every part of their life, including the actions they do with their hands, the clothes they wear, is marking them and devoting them to that passage from Deuteronomy. If you've ever watched them pray, as I sat there in Brooklyn, whether it was the subway or a cafe, standing at a traffic light to change, or at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, you'd watch them do that rocking. On an airplane, watching them do that rocking as they prayed. No, they're not ADD like me. It's called davening. It's the reflection, the flickering flame of a candle is the idea. And that they're so wrapped up, even with their body caught up into God's worship and scripture, that they would say, the candlestick of God is the flickering soul of a human being. They are so centered and devoted. I'm not saying we should wear those strange clothes. But there's no doubt as to what is the priority in their life when you see them. In the West, whether it was London, the United States, Australia, or here, when you see somebody who's totally sold out with their life, their life reoriented, their behaviors and their values, the way they live and how they share life with others, they're often referred to as Jesus freaks, always in a condescending, derogatory way. And the Jewish people wear it with pride and no compromise. When you think of Zebedee, the father of Big James and John, when his sons were invited by the rabbi, Yahshua, Jesus, to follow him, and he left the family business, which was very important. There was no Somerset in that day and age. He celebrated with great joy that his sons wouldn't be at dinner that night, for they were off to pursue the study and understanding of God's word, to receive Torah into their life. For the Jew, the sincere worshiper, the center of that life was that rabbi who was so sold out to God, who would lead them in worship, lead them in prayer, lead the people in trying times, be the magistrate to decide disagreements, was respected and sold out in head and heart and character. When you see a passionate Jew, they will love the word and their rabbi will lead them to love the word. Jews and their relationship with rabbis. The post-exilic Jewish Hebrew people, the temple destroyed in captivity and afterwards, saw the rise of this institution of the local synagogue and the importance of the rabbi in their life. And it changed and brought Israel, the Jewish people, to a level of worship and devotion they actually had not known since Moses. Led by these rabbis, aware that they were led into captivity as consequence for not following God with a true and undivided heart. They were set on being devoted to God so that they might be ready and Messiah would come. Now, I'm going to fully admit and I'm, again, this is why I'm not saying we should do what they do the way they do, but there's something about their character and their devotion that we can learn from God's people, the grafted ones into the olive tree. Yes, they got obsessed on the magnifying glass rather than what the magnifying glass was revealed. They got obsessed on this instruction and these laws and these prayers rather than what it told us. But you can't question their love of God. In week one in this series, we looked at you can't really grasp the scriptures, Old Testament and New, without understanding the Jewish culture. You had to understand Jesus as a Jew, and today Jesus as a rabbi and more. In that time of the first century, the Jewish people, to quote Charles Dickens, it was the worst of times and it was the best of times. 
It was the best of times because they were all united and they were all following God with great heart. It was the worst of times because they were oppressed now by like the sixth occupier in this one of the worst. A town three miles north of Nazareth, Sapphira, in 4 BC, about when Jesus was born, had a rebellion against the Romans. They were going to kick the Romans out and start it across Israel. Well, you know the answer to that. The 10th Legion marched on that small city and crushed it, separating every stone one from another, killing a majority of the population, selling every last surviving soul off into slavery, and salting the land around it so that nothing would ever grow to this day. It was very clear this ruthless Roman presence that parked a Roman garrison at Nazareth, the nearest town. It gave them this complex PTSD, this trauma of this ongoing suffering that they had had, and we would understand that. Like a kid born around or growing up in and through and after 9-11 in Brooklyn. Or a kid growing up in and around Christchurch with the earthquakes. And kids around the world growing up in an unending pandemic that never seems to end and nothing seems to really work And how long will we endure this? We don't even understand the psychological implications for all of us, much less kids. But these people somehow did more than survive. And the majority were not apathetic. And most of them thrived in their life as the people of God together, pursuing God's word. Some of the groups that existed were the Sadducees. That's not Sadducees. I'll come to them in a second. The Sadducees were sad, you see. They really didn't take God very serious. They figured this is the day we're in. You live with it and you get on. And they collaborated with the Romans and they played loose with the ethics and the morals. They really didn't believe God's word had any power or truth. And they just kind of played the game. You had the Zealots who were going to bring it to happen politically now. There's some countries that many of us are fond of who've experienced that approach. There's the Essenes, which were really like the monastics. Even these passionate Jews were too liberal for them. They just withdrew and lived apart from society trying to follow God. And then there were the Pharisees, passionate to follow God. 500 years of this growing ethos and identity, obsessed with God's word. Yeah. Yes, the whole magnifying glass thing. But these people were the ones that thrived and their communities thrived in these most tough times. In these times, by the way, that's a um, Bet Midrash in Brooklyn on the right and the original um, synagogue in Capernaum which is built on top of just a few decades after Jesus on top of the synagogue that Jesus would have been in there in Capernaum, but it had the very same footprint. In these villages of these people so passionate, so undivided like our culture, divided in 50,000 different distractions, by age five, every boy and girl could quote the Torah, the first five books. And there were no chapters, and there were no verses. You would simply, the rabbi would say a statement, the father and mother would say a statement, and they would continue it. From 5 to 13, they memorized the rest of the Old Testament. And at 12 and 13, they began to wrestle the questions. In this Jewish culture of asking you a question and you responding with the question, or referring to sentences just before, or just after, or to another part of Scripture to demonstrate your understanding and to take the conversation to the next step. This study would continue, and those who remained to stay on to study more would learn this art of question answered with a question answered with a question. It'd be common in the evenings to walk through any village, town, or city and to hear the grandparents, the parents, the aunts and uncles, the cousins, the children, Reciting scripture and asking each other questions. Kids asking their parents to unpack it even more. There's pressure on a parent to have their act together for homework. 
The closest thing I ever experienced myself was being in the beautiful walled city of Assisi in the Umbra Mountains in Italy. And in Assisi, at the, at the nine prayer hours of the day, nine times a day, this totally overwhelming cacophony of bells from churches and monasteries and convents began to ring out with one, and quickly they all start ringing and answering, proclaiming time to talk to God again. Time to turn to God, to stop our pace and worship God again. I imagine the Jewish community where everyone was so focused on God's word. The Jews in Torah, the third highest form of worship was song. The second highest form of worship was prayer. The highest form of worship is a Jew, the study of God's word. They would tell you, That when we sing, we praise God. When we pray, we speak to God. When we study God's word, he speaks to us. Is that these people, passionate lovers and shaped by God, much of their teaching, whether it was parents, friends, or with their rabbis, was done in the Kodak moment. Most of you aren't old enough to remember the Kodak moment. When we were first married, Suzanne carried this little Instamatic camera in her purse so we could capture the moment that is unplanned for and just happens. And Kodak, working to be a very successful company, gave us the idea of the Kodak moment. You have that camera to capture that moment that wasn't planned and you want to remember that they would worship with this word. Now Jesus is rabbi, the first lover of Torah. From his childhood, he pursued the Torah. We all know the story at 12. He's in the temple asking questions and answering questions in the culture with the scribes and Pharisees and priests and knocking sixes for three days. Amazing at such a young age, he had such a command of his father's words. You'd find it surprising that the group he most aligned to would be the Pharisees. Now, you wouldn't think so, because he had affectionate little nicknames for some of them. Hypocrites, whitewashed tombs, brood of vipers. Yet, he actually wasn't counter to everything. And the Pharisees and he understood the game of question with a question with a question. And he behaved as a rabbi in his teaching to get the central wrestling where learning is not fill in the blank, where learning is to grasp the deep meat and not just milk. He often used those questions and he used parables. He often talked in stories like the four soils, Another rabbi talked about the four forms of a disciple that sits at the rabbi's feet, the sponges, the funnels, the strainers, and the sieves, encouraging people to be the sieve that sifts out the finest truths, the tiniest truths, and actually not the sponge or the funnel. In his wrestling matches, He would ask these questions with questions and challenge with an unanswered ending. The prodigal son, when he talks about the prodigal and then he tells the story about the brother and he leaves the brother's response unanswered, begging questions. How did the older brother respond? The rich young ruler who's seeking and Jesus gives him half the commandments, the vertical ones, and leaving out the horizontal ones and leaves it for this young fellow to wrestle. Another famous rabbi lamented the death of his most challenging opponent. Another rabbi. And he said in his lament, I now have no one to spar with, no one to force me to refine my thinking. Some Pharisees tried to trap Jesus. Others were just being good Jews and wrestling. But Jesus' ministry began before that public ministry that we heard in the gospel that Angus read to us. He was already moving and speaking and teaching God's people. And he taught them in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, 
where we have that exchange you heard. You see, to be a rabbi who would speak in any synagogue, much less multiple synagogues, you had to be invited. You had to be affirmed that you were living an honorable life following Torah. And you had to, by moral character, be above reproached. And if you notice, every character that approached and wrestled with him, be they brood of vipers or a Nicodemus, nobody refuted that he was a rabbi. But he was so much more than just a rabbi. He was a prophet and a priest, as our gospel reading showed us. He was more than a gold medal TED Talk expert. He was recognized as a prophet. And the people longed for Messiah. They used to say, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses is our rabbi. And he came speaking beyond in surprising, intriguing ways that no one had ever heard. I looked for a way to explain this, and I thought of this great symphony that's been written, and the orchestra loves to play it, and they do it so beautifully and so well, and then they invite the composer's son to come and do the solo and play with them. And the composer's son who knows his father and understands his intent and can translate the li- beyond the limits of the black marks on a page and bring it to life in a way that's never been seen before, bringing eyes to the thousands that fill the hall. He takes the Torah, the instruction of the Lord, and brings it alive in a way that is insatiable. Recently deceased, Orthodox rabbi, Mir Zlotowicz. That's him there. Summarizing when Messiah comes. That Messiah would be one of the nation. Not as in the nation state defined by the UN. But one of the people of God. One of them, as one of them, representing them. He would be the living embodiment of Torah. He would be the holder of unbridled power. He would submit himself to the instruction of Torah. And he would not rest until the people know the rigors, the joy of studying Torah. And he would be of the highest moral character and fiber. He went on, they they asked him, from where where are you getting this? And he goes, well, from many passages, don't you know your your scriptures? But he pointed them to this passage in Deuteronomy, which is using that imagery of a king defining who Messiah would be. And if you look there, the fourth line from the bottom, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Talking about that character. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he'll write for himself in a book a copy of the law. And he'll read it, and he'll know it, and he'll live it. In our society, we don't esteem rabbis or pastors or theologians. Many of us would be at a loss to name any that we pursue and study and try to understand the deeper things of. We're in a culture that esteems celebrity. People who pretend, people who can sing, and people who can play with the ball. And we make great heroes of them, though they don't know God or his scripture. Few of them are wise or discerning. Many of their heart treasures are temporal and conditional. And we don't need to have a conversation about a lot of their moral fiber. Christ is this ultimate rabbi, this shepherd, this prophet, and our priest. We're familiar with the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And Ezekiel later writing on that gave us that passage that was read to us as the first reading. That he'll be our shepherd and he will form and lead us, drawing us into God's word. In Genesis, we find this mysterious character brought to life. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. This priest of this order that had no understanding of framework, it wasn't part of the law, it was outside of it. He's mentioned there and in this place only in this inauguration, this ordination of Abram to be the leader of God's people. Later the psalmist writes, 
And that whole passage of Psalm 110, but I picked out four. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then we get to Hebrews. And there's multiple readings of this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham. And then you drop down to the bottom of verse 2. King of righteousness, king of Salem. He's without father or mother or genealogy, having no beginning nor end. Resembling the Son of God, he comes a priest forever. In this passage from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7, he's mentioned seven times. We find Melchizedek, the, this priest of this order, this one who comes forever above the earthly orders of priests of the Old Testament. He comes on our behalf. And at chapter 7, I'll read you this one passage. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of power of an indestructible life, for it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This epiphany, this appearing of Messiah, our prophet, our shepherd, our priest, our rabbi in the Old Testament, born through and, and accomplishing for us, leading us as the rabbis of any village, accomplishing what no one else could, as we discussed last week. And in summary, rabbis were central to these people. They were the guardians of God's people and God's word. And these people were united in pursuing that together. Jesus understood himself to be a rabbi. Everyone, even opponents, recognized him as a rabbi and as a prophet. But he's more than that. He's our priest, the ultimate guardian, indestructible, prince of righteousness and prince of peace. And if we would but order ourselves around God and chew and digest the deepest things and allow the Spirit to lead us, we would be so resilient even in such crazy times. So when you go home, take this with you. The highest form of worship above song, above prayer, is the study of God's Word. Ask yourself as I ask myself, what kind of disciple am I? A sponge? A funnel? A strainer? Or a sieve? Is my life seed that fell on rocky soil or thorny soil or hard, compacted soil or fertile soil? What do I want to be? David wrote in the first psalm, Blesses the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his life is in the meditation of God's word day and night. So where is my treasure? And what do I esteem? And what is my priority? And what are the things that distract me? And do I want to lay them aside? I ask myself this every day. I still haven't shared Xbox, I confess. And I ask myself, do I really want Jesus to be my rabbi of my whole life? To have his way in every area of my life. My cynicisms, my condensations, my gossip disguised as prayer request, my guarded trust to let God access to that room. Do I want him to be my king, my priest, my Lord? Do I really want to surrender? Do I really trust where he'll take me next? And in such times, Am I going to grip and stay in the foxhole and be afraid? Am I going to be apathetic like the Sadducees? Or in the face of these challenges, because I've allowed the word to bake in and through me and transformed and opened my heart to the will of the Spirit, that I might actually thrive and be a source of life. I think of the Chinese when the bamboo curtain finally fell and we found a few thousand Christians had become tens 
of millions of Christians in a land we expected them to just survive and not thrive. Let us pray. Loving God, be our teacher. Be the lover of our soul and our life. God, our thinking, our emotions, our behaviors only move towards you when our will is pliable to you. Fill us with your spirit. Make us true disciples. Be our rabbi. Show us your word. Teach us to worship you in song, in prayer, and the pursuit of what you are saying to us. In Jesus' name.